And in today's class, we're looking at the jump in thinking that led to the understanding of the atom as we understand it today using quantum physics. The first thing that's, that uh, precipitated a deepening of our understanding was that scientists tried to explain the light that atoms emit in terms of classical physics. And in classical, in classical physics, whenever an atom was heated up, it would, uh, it would tumble and vibrate more, more um, rapidly. This is how we've come to understand through the kinetic molecular theory what temperature means. An increase in temperature means the atoms have more thermal agitation. And they extended that notion to the vibrations of the atoms themselves. They tried to imagine the atoms as though they were uh, two uh, heavy metallic balls connected by a spring. Now, if you were to pull that spring and let it go, the two balls would start vibrating uh, back and forth. Or they would also start wagging according to the stiffness of the spring. But that explanation was not sufficient when it came to explaining the wavelengths that are emitted in the ultraviolet spectrum. When they tried to explain, when they tried to predict how many, um, um, how much light would be emitted by a black body radiation, the theory failed spectacularly. In fact, they called it the ultraviolet catastrophe. So the laws of classical physics failed spectacularly when applied to predict the emission of ultraviolet light. This was called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Fortunately, Max Planck had discovered an equation that accurately predicted the wavelengths and intensity of emitted light for a black body. And the way he was able to predict accurately what, what, what kind of ultraviolet light would be emitted by a black body was to use the idea that uh, light is composed of photons. So there were discrete small packets of energy that are emitted whenever light is, is um, irradiated, irradiated from a source. So depending on what orbital an electron is kicked out of, it re-emits a photon as it decays back to its ground state. Once they made this quantum leap in thinking, they were able to uh, start developing tenable explanations for why, for example, hydrogen had a, a spectrum with four lines in it, and why the lines were of a certain color. Planck, Planck, Max Planck found that the energy of any given photon is related to its frequency according to the equation E is equal to h nu where u is the frequency of the radiation, h is Planck's constant, and e is the energy in uh, joules. So you can find out the uh, energy content of any single photon if you know its frequency. So I ask the question here, what is the energy content of a 350 nanometer photon, which is corresponding to ultraviolet light, compared to a 750 nanometer photon, which corresponds to the infrared side of the spectrum? So neither one of those two photons are visible to the human eye. And one is on one end of the spectrum, the other one is on the other end of the spectrum. Uh, UV is typically considered the higher energy kind of light. You get a, a tan from ultraviolet light, whereas infrared light merely feels, uh, gives you a sensation of warmth <coughs> when you're exposed to it. If you've, ever, uh, if you've ever gotten close enough to a campfire to see it, if it's a really big campfire, or if you've ever seen a car burning on the road, even as you drive by, you can feel the heat through the window of your car. That's because of the, um, the infrared radiation emitted by a burning body. So we did a calculation here to, to determine what the energy content of a single photon of both 350 nanometer wavelength and 750 nanometer wavelength. So the longer wavelengths are normally associated with a lower energy content, but let's prove it mathematically. So I found the frequency of the wave of the radiation by using C is equal to lambda nu. I rearranged the equation to find uh, the frequency. I should have done this part first, but I didn't realize it until after I wrote it. So you would probably want to write this part first in your notes and then this line second. Although it's not the end of the world if you do it the same way I did. Anyway, here's the speed of light divided by the wavelength of the uh, light in nanometers. Notice how I convert it to meters. So it's 350 times 10 to the minus 9 because nanometers is a billionth of a meter. And it gives you a frequency of 8.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz. That's a very high frequency, 10 to the 14 vibrations per second. For the second photon, we can move to the second blackboard, or whiteboard rather, uh, the uh, wavelength is 750 nanometers. And when we rearrange the equation, we get almost 4 times 10 to the 14 hertz. So I plug that into the equation E is equal to h nu, using Planck constant, multiplying the constant, which is in joules per hertz, times hertz. The hertz cancel. 
and we get that the uh, infrared photon has an energy of 2.64 times 10 to the minus 19 joules, while the uh, ultraviolet photon has uh, twice the energy content, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. The, U the UV photon then has twice the energy of the infrared photon. Back in 1905, Einstein published a paper that explained the photoelectric effect. It was one of the three papers that he published that uh, uh, should have merited him the Nobel Prize. I think he got one for the theory of relativity. But all three of the papers that he published in 1905 were, were uh, Nobel Prize material. The photoelectric effect is, is the, a phenomenon that occurs that when you shine light on certain metals, they emit electrons. Uh, the, the, the two particularly sensitive metals for that are rubidium and cesium. Metals are more susceptible of losing electrons, but rubidium and cesium are particularly easy to get to lose electrons by shining light on them. They're, they're what are used in um, electric eyes or in uh, night vision goggles to amplify the very small amount of light that's present. They use a lens that has a... Um, or rather, they use a detector that has a, a rubidium or a cesium plate to release electrons, which are then captured and amplified, creating a, sign a signal that, that's used to generate an image. Uh, anyway, Einstein was able to explain this effect in terms of the notion that to get an electron to come off of a, a, a metallic atom, you have to pump it with some, a certain amount of energy. And if you pump it with the right frequency, it works. On the other hand, if you don't have a strong enough frequency, if your frequency doesn't have enough energy, you can shine all the light you want on the metal and no electrons come out. So there is a threshold frequency at which the electron will come out of the atom. And this is what Einstein realized. There had to have a certain frequency, and then if there was extra bright light of the right frequency, then you'd get more electrons coming out with extra energy. But if the, if the light didn't have that threshold frequency, the photoelectric effect wouldn't happen. So that was a... The explanation of that phenomenon opened, opened the understanding to other ideas in quantum theory. Chemists at around the same time also discovered that shooting a beam of electrons at any molecule could cause it to lose one of its elect electrons, thereby leaving the molecule with a positive charge and making it susceptible to acceleration by both magnetic and electric fields. This paved the way to, uh, for the discovery of the mass spectrometer, which is a widely used diagnostic tool nowadays. We use mass spectrometers to find the molar mass of unknown samples of, of uh, chemical substances. And I, uh, I do an example a question here from Brown. It's on page 48, the practice example. It tells us, I want to read you the question. It asks us, three isotopes of silicon occur in nature. Silicon 28, which is 92.23%, which has an atomic mass of 27.97693 atomic ma mass units. Silicon 29, which has a 4.68 abundance and has an atomic mass of 28.97649 atomic mass units. And silicon 30, which is 3.09% abundant and has an atomic mass of 29.97377 atomic mass units. Calculate the atomic weight of silicon. This is simply... Um, Calculating the average mass of an atom uh, of an of a random sample of atoms based on its relative isotopic abundance. So it's 92% of this stuff, 4% of this stuff, and 3% of that stuff. We find the mass average by multiplying the percent times the mass of the iso particular isotope divided by the um, sample size. Well, in this case, it's already been taken into account and you get an average mass. So the, mass the average mass of uh, silicon is 28.1 atomic mass units. We see the same phenomenon um, affecting the molar mass of carbon. We know by definition that a, a, a mole is uh, 6.02 times 10 to the 23 atoms of carbon-12, of isotopically pure carbon-12. But the, the carbon that we find in nature is a combination of carbon-12, 13, and 14. And that's why the mass that's reported on the periodic table is 12.011. It's a little bit higher than 12 because there's a 1% of the carbon in nature is carbon-13. And a very small percentage is also carbon-14. So it raises the average of the atomic mass. 
Mass spectrometry is widely used by analytical chemists for routine measurements of unknown substances. So, uh, for example, let's do another question where we have a sample of 101 atoms, and five of those atoms weigh 176, 19 of the atoms weigh 177, 28 of the atoms weigh 178, 14 of the atoms weigh 179, and 35 of the atoms weigh 180. How do we find the atomic mass of the average atom in the sample? Well, you multiply each by the number of atoms, by its abundance, and divide by the number of atoms, and you'll get an atomic mass of 178.55 atomic mass units.